Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I am so happy and grateful to have Joyce with us today, who has positively changed hundreds of people's lives just by shifting their relationship with money. Over 19 years in the banking and investment industry, experience as a financial advisor and a master's in business administration has made Joyce an expert in money matters. However, understanding money didn't always come easy to Joyce. As a daughter to two immigrant parents, she painfully watched as her father exhausted himself working two jobs in order to provide for her family. She couldn't understand why making money was so hard for him, but easy for others. What had other people figured out that her father had it? And here began her quest to solve the secret behind money. Joyce is a money mindset mentor and transformational speaker. Her impactful work focuses on helping people take control of their money lives, gain financial clarity, and create the mindset needed to succeed in life. Joyce has been featured in Thrive Global and has worked with companies like Citibank, SBDC, Polkadot Powerhouse, Rutgers University, New York City Central Labor Council, and various nonprofits. If she's not on stage or consulting, you'll find her spending time with her son or escaping to a beach in a foreign country. Joyce, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hi, Jesse. Good to see you on here. And I'm, I'm really grateful because I think this is a topic that is or should be in many ways on everybody's mind right now. You know, we're in a very, very unique time in history where we have a lot of uncertainty in the economy. We have, at least here in the US, our government is pumping trillions, not millions, not billions, but trillions, the T word that we never usually hear of unless it's around debt, into the economy. And millions of people are getting stimulus checks, unemployment wages, all sorts of uh, small business loans that may be forgiven. So there's getting this huge infusion of cash into the economy right now. Considering all of that, what, is, what, do, what do people need to know and understand about this money coming in? I, you and I were talking a little bit offline, like it, it, it works theoretically if, if everybody's using the money fiscally responsibly. Mm -hmm. that's a theoretically so what are some need to knows for people with this money coming in right now um so i think a couple of need to knows um there's been a lot of questions in regards to this money uh one of them has been hey can i trust it right so you're getting money from the government then the question is, is the government going to expect this back from me? Are they going to take this from my tax refund next year? Are they going to tax me for it? And so that's one of the things on people's mind. Um, that the question, the answer to that is no, it's not going to be taxed and it's not going to be taken back or at least that's the thought process around it, that they're not going to be taking it back from you in, in some way, shape or form. This was, created to be able to help people through this crisis you know um my opinion it wasn't done you know perfectly uh, because they had a very tight time frame um but that's i think on a lot of people's minds but i think like one of the things that we should really consider is what we'll do with this money and i think that's where a little bit of the worry is and concern from my opinion, just because I've seen in being almost 20 years in banking and investments, I've seen how people handle money. And so that's where we have to be really cautious on what we're doing with the money that we're getting, if we're getting money. What are the three or five most important things in your opinion that people should be doing with this money that's coming in? I will give you three. I'll give you my top three. I think number one should definitely be reserves. My advice to every client that comes my way is you should have at least four months to six months of reserves. What that means is if I look at what my expenses are on a monthly basis, and I'm talking about bare bones expenses. I'm not talking about your lattes or getting your nails done or getting your hair done. Talk about bare bones expenses. That's your rent, your mortgage, um, your utilities, your food. You know, those are the things that you're gonna have to pay. If you add those up, those are your bare bones expenses, your vital expenses. 
and you should have at least four months worth of those monthly expenses. Now, many people will be like, are you kidding me? That's, that's a lot, you know, but even if you have two months worth, you know, it's something that can help you in times like these, because this check, the max that was supposed to come out is 1,200 for anyone that made under 75,000. So that check's gonna come out, 1,200, right? It's gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find it in my, my account. Mm -hmm. But then what's gonna happen next month? There's not gonna be anybody there to give me another 1,200. Mm. You know, we need to recognize that we are responsible for ourselves. The government's not responsible for us. They're not, they never have been. We're responsible for ourselves. So if this money's coming in and you're in a good spot, you still have a job, you know, or, you, or you, maybe your business is still um, going, maybe not as strong, but as money's still coming in, take this money and make sure that you have reserves of at least four months. That's number one. If you do have your, your reserves in your savings accounts, then I would say, okay, so then you can use it for whatever it is that you needed it, right? So if your business isn't as strong, you can use it for whatever your business expenses are. Um, the other thing, the third thing you can do is you can use it to pay down debt. So those are the three. It's you either save it and put it for your reserves if you haven't put away reserves you can put it towards the things that you have to purchase if you need them like necessities. And then third, you can use them to pay down debt. That would be what I would do if I got that 1,200. You know, it's really interesting hearing you say that because some of the, the data I've read and seen doesn't seem to suggest that that's what a lot of people are doing with it or mm -hmm. talking about doing with it. I feel like I've seen more posts on Facebook about I got my money together and then they're going to the grocery store buying filet mignon and, oh, <laughs> and campaign versus getting a London broil and soda water or something like that or just drinking tap water mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to set this aside because, you know, being financially responsible. Why is it important? Why the debt piece was interesting. Why is it important to pay down debt? And I want to touch on this because I think one of the things I've been talking with people over the series and just others outside of this that's been confusing is it seems like people are in this kind of hypnosis, if you will, that they're not going to have to pay their mortgage. They're not going to have to pay their rent, that it's going to be forgiven, that credit card companies are being really nice and letting them slide on payments right now. And that, and I don't think they quite grasp the fact that them working with them flexibly now is not saying, hey, you're not going to owe this money down the road, right. right? So why is paying debt down so important right now? Um, one, because nothing comes for free, okay? And then when it does come for free, do you really want it? I don't know about that. Like, I don't like free things because typically they're like not good things. Yeah. So so nothing comes for free the whole thing with the mortgage that you're not going to have to pay your rent that's not true or you're not going to have to pay your mortgage that's not true what's going on is that if you lost your job right and you were affected because of all this because of covid then that's when you're you can possibly not pay your mortgage. It's going to depend on what type of mortgage you have, if it's a federally backed mortgage. So there's certain rules around that. You know, some people think, oh yeah, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have to pay my mortgage. I'm not going to have to pay my rent. And that's not necessarily true. It has to be federally backed mortgage. And so right now, if you say, I'm not going to pay for these next three months, because I really, I cannot pay for the next three months, that's not going to just go away. It's going to be placed on the end of the loan. Mm. They're deferring it. It's not like, it, you know, a fairy takes care of it for you. So it's deferred. And the same thing with rent. It doesn't mean that you don't have to pay. You're still going to owe that money in rent. It just means that your landlord can't evict you for a certain amount of months. That's it. But then imagine yourself in a position where 
you decided not to pay your rent and instead you're going and you're buying filet mignon with that with that money then what's going to happen is later you can live that time frame right where they can't kick you out you'll live there for six months but what happens after six months and i think that's what many of um us americans don't realize yeah. we don't the head we don't think well what's going to happen six months from now six months from now what's going to happen is you're going to go looking for an apartment and you're not going to be able to find one because no one's going to want to give it to you because mm -hmm. now on your record you're going to have that you have bad credit you didn't pay rent and you're not going to be able to say oh yeah you can speak to my landlord um i was a good tenant so that ruins your possibility of opportunity in the future and that's what we're not looking at i love that the possibility of opportunity hey mm -hmm. I, I think you're you're right like unfortunately one of the struggles with maybe first world countries america especially is we're so short-sighted in instant gratification that we're not looking ahead. We're not willing to be a little bit of uncomfortable in the near term to be able to be maximum comfort in the long term. Right, right. I agree with you. I think that that's a big thing. It's this, this idea of comfort, you know, we're so comfortable. And the other piece of it is the consumerism around it. Yeah. I mean, we've been sold this, this idea of consumerism like okay whoever has the most expensive cars the most successful are they because yeah. i've met a whole lot of people that are driving expensive cars and i've looked at their balance sheets and i've looked at their accounts and it looks like shit yeah so really it's just this idea of okay i if i buy this kind of thing if i have this kind of house or this kind of car it makes me successful. It doesn't. I read, I don't remember what the book was, but I remember it was such a profound note thing to read where it was saying that the majority of $50,000 cars were driven by people who make less than $50,000 a year. And it was, the majority was like the 60 to 80% of the people who drive $50,000 cars. Or, and I thought, God, that is such a crazy statistic. But then you start to observe behavior and you see it. And then I feel like, <clears throat> and maybe this goes into that notion where it's gotten such a bad rap where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Is it really as simple as that? Or is it just that people are, the people who are willing to delay comfort are able to make better decisions and then it enables them to accumulate wealth that we may put this label on called rich? I think that, yes. I think that there's, there's two parts to that. I do think that the people that are rich or that are wealthier have delayed comfort. That's one. Um, but I also think that they are, I think that they're not uh, quickly sold on this mirage of mm -hmm. what success is. I do think that that's a big, a big issue with um, a lot of our youth, a lot of us, you know, even you look at your friends that are in your 30s and your, in your 40s. And yeah, I mean, they may seem like they're very um, well off and successful. And then when you really look behind the curtain, they're not. We've all been taught to create this facade. We've all been taught, you know, from when we were kids, I think that talking about money is not a good thing you know, and that if you're not well off, then it's a shameful thing, you know? So there's a lot of pressure on us to be something that's considered successful. And the only people that are creating this definition of success is society. Mm. And what's even worse is that it's not only society, it's these big companies, these billion dollar companies that are creating this idea of what success truly is. And then they advertise it and they market it. And then it makes us believe that we have to look like that in order for us to be successful and be living this American dream. You know, so yeah. even if you look at the whole American dream, I mean, I'm not sold on that. I was when I was younger, 
but I'm not sold on it. Like you're going to tell me that the only way I could be happy is because is if I get married, have two kids, have a dog, have a beautiful house with a white picket fence and yeah. beautiful green grass. Don't forget the well shiny polished car too. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and a good car and the drive. Like yeah. that's it's the only way. That's crazy because yeah. for me personally, I've been happiest being divorced, <laughs> a single mom. Mm. And I mean, really that's, that's for me having been the happiest and most successful. And I've made way more money than I've ever made in my past. Mm. Not being in that little box of the American dream. Yeah, that reminds me, Joyce, I, I don't remember where I read this up, but it was saying something that more millionaires were made by clipping coupons and buying from secondhand stores than were ever made paying were ever made paying full price and buying designer clothes at retail. And the idea was is that there was this big study that was done with people who were millionaires, not like not like people who are the 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 famous millionaires names behind it. So celebrities or movie stars or anything like that, but people who had, who had done it the old fashioned way, saving, mm -hmm. investing, saving, investing. And what they were finding was, is that trends, the majority of those people were still clipping coupons. Mm -hmm. They were, if they needed to buy a nice dress or a nice suit to go to some benefit or something, they'd go to a secondhand store and look for it. And instead of paying hundred dollars or five hundred dollars they're paying ten dollars or fifty dollars for it you know just these little behavior things but again it goes back to that delayed com that delayed comfort delayed comfort delayed comfort delayed comfort and even when now they have this wealth they're still practicing the same practices because they've learned and i think what they're saying is they've learned what you just perfectly articulated that they have found that their happiest times have been when they're the most removed from that notion of what it means to be successful or wealthy. And in so doing, not only do you find more happiness, but they're also making more money too. Yeah. And I actually, I, I want to, maybe I want to rephrase that phrase, delayed comfort, just because I, I don't want people to think that you have to be uncomfortable now to be comfortable later, it's not necessarily the case. What you do have to do is you have to be realistic. You have to be mm -hmm. realistic. And if you look at your numbers and you, you look at them and you say, okay, this is what I can afford, right? And so you stick within your numbers, but you also have a plan for your numbers. So if you make whatever it is, you know, $5,000, let's say on a monthly basis, then there should be a plan around it. There should be a certain percentage that you're going to be putting away to save just for cushion money. There should be a certain percentage that you're going to be putting away for long-term money. That's retirement, right? So let's say your cushion money can be 10% your retirement can be 20%. You know, there should be some type of plan around your money. And so then you plan first, you spend second. And that's the whole idea with pay yourself first. Pay yourself first, that became cliche, but people don't actually do it. Paying yourself first means when that money comes into my account, I am going to be the first person that sees that money. So that means my 20% that I'm going to be putting into my 401k or my SEP IRA, if you're um, self-employed, that's going to be the first thing. That's going to be the first mm -hmm. line item. It's not going to be taxes. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be the first line, line item that I pay. Then after I'm done putting away to my retirement and then putting away to my savings, then I'm going to take the rest of it and I'm going to see what debt needs to be paid that I have, you know, then what do I want to, you know, what are my utilities? What are the stuff that I have to pay for? Then what's left over. Hmm. And that's when you use, Oh yeah, I do want to go on a trip or I do want to buy these things, you know? So that's really truly paying yourself first is Macy's doesn't see your money first. You know, American express doesn't see it. You know, Trader Joe's doesn't see it. Nothing. The, the bar down the street doesn't see it. 
none of that sees it first. You have to be putting away for yourself first. That I is love that. plan first, spend second. Yeah. Joyce, you know, as well as I do, right, how much human behavior is driven by emotion and mindset. <clears throat> I'm wondering, your clients who you've seen be really successful with, with that notion, planning first, spending second, the ones you've seen be really fiscally responsible, who have, who have built up a, f- a financial resources, do you see their mindset, and their emotion, like what are they focusing on that differentiates them from those who don't? That's a good question. Um, I think one of the mind, one of the parts what I've I've realized about people that are very successful and their mindset is they're not number one. They're not as fearful mm. with money. So there's a very big difference between an entrepreneur and someone that says, "Okay, <clears throat> here's." Two hundred thousand dollars. You know, I'm going to see what we can do with it. Their mindset is: here's two hundred thousand dollars. I made those two hundred thousand dollars. I want this two hundred thousand dollars to grow. How am I going to make it grow? That's their mindset. Hmm. They look at something and they they find possibility. They're looking for possibility. In possibility, there is an aspect of risk. Okay. So they're okay with taking risk. They believe that they can make money grow. Hmm. There's a very big difference between that type of person and then let's say a divorcee, you know, where I have sat with many women that, okay, just got divorced. This is my portion of it. What do I do with this? And the fear that is within them. Why? Because they feel they didn't make that money. Mm. And they have no idea how, if that was to go away. So that type of person will be more likely to say, I'm not going to be in the market. I just want to, you know, put this in a CD. This is all I have. They don't know how to make it. So the mindset needs to be, and this is for everybody, you know, and this is what kind of worries me with this 1,200 going to you. Understand that that's a one-time fix. Yeah. But, the, but what you're supposed to be doing, the point is to be able to create your own money. That is the mindset. How do I create my own money? Not depending on the government, not depending on a husband, not depending on a wife, not depending on any of that stuff, on a, on a corporation. Because look, people that depend on a corporation, we just got a bunch of layoffs. Yeah. You know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So if I don't depend on that, can I trust myself to make money? Can I trust myself to say, all right, here's $10. How the hell am I going to make a hundred out of it? That's a mindset. I love that. How do I create my money? God, that's mm-hmm. such a great question to ask. I got goosebumps when you said that. that if we, if we all began our day with that. How can I create my money? Right. Because right. And I think so much the psychology is so critical with this, right? We think I, how, what, how am I going to get my government money? And, and I see this with people who I know who really struggle with this part of it. It's, 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 they've already decided that they can't, they've already decided that they shouldn't have to. They've already decided that, you know, basically like they're different than everybody else and they should just be able to sleep in and, and whatever, but they're not asking that question. Like, how do I create my money? So on the notion of creation, where are the opportunities right now to earn money? Is there opportunities investing? Is there opportunities with people who have money, who have money and they're, they're, they're wanting to grow it. They're wanting to create it. What should they be doing with that money now? I'm going to get back to that question, but I want to just add something to what you just said. Okay. So you just said, okay, this, this, this person is already feeling, okay, this money's coming to me. Um, They're already feeling like they can't create money. They have to depend on something else to create money, right? They don't have that mentality. Well, what ends up happening when they do continue to depend on outside help, 
So you continue to depend on unemployment. You continue to depend on welfare. You continue to depend on um, any type of outside help. What ends up happening is that now they're telling you, you can't create money. Mm. So now it's not only you thinking, oh, I can't create money. I don't know how. Now it's coming from a different source, right? The government that's saying, yeah, you can't create money. That's why we have to help you. You know, are they vocalizing that? No, but they're giving you money and then people apply for it, right? They're like, okay, it ran out. Yeah. You know, my six months of unemployment is gone. So now I have to reapply, try to get some more time. Then they get that. Well, that's just subconsciously reinforcing your thought that you can't create money, that you, you need another source. And that's what we're not realizing. We're not realizing mm -hmm. that the welfare system, although it is helpful for certain people for a certain amount of time, that is the whole point, is to have it for a certain amount of time, not for lifetime. This, is, this wasn't made for a lifetime. So for a certain amount of time, it's okay because it's helpful. But at what time do we begin teaching people, right, how to fish instead yeah. of giving them the fish? So in doing that, in just continuing this system, then you're basically telling the person, you're not, you're not smart enough to make your own money. You're not, you're not a creator. Hmm. You're just a taker. Hmm. And that's where I feel that that whole system of, hey, let's just help all the poor and keep helping them. Yes, help them. But why don't we help them through education? Why yeah. don't we help them through mindset shifts? Why don't we try that instead of constantly just giving, giving, because then you're not teaching them anything. You're keeping them exactly where they are in the same level. So that's just, I'm I need to that. That's so, so unbelievably important. Yeah. And I think it's such, it's such a piece because it's about helping should be, could be coincided or in hand in hand with empowering. Right. Right. <clears throat> and I think sometimes that piece is majorly missed. Right. And if we were to all, I, I mean, I think about the most beneficial thing I ever learned in school. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm fortunate I got to get a four year education and all that after high school. But the best thing I ever learned in school was in fifth and sixth grade, we did a little mini society where everybody got to run their own business and you had your little mini government and you got to make money and stuff. And I, I learned so much from that. And it's funny, like I will think back on that sometimes and you can see these early stages of human behavior even playing out in kids. Mm -hmm. And you would see a very distinct, uh, I was always like one of the more successful businesses, but it wasn't because my business was so successful that I ran it was. It was also like, I never spent stuff on everything, but everybody mm -hmm. else would go and take their money and they'd spend it on all this other stuff. <laughs> and I, you know, so that was such an invaluable lesson to me that, you know, I don't have to spend money on stuff because I had more joy in providing a service to the other people who were there. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the opportunities now, Joyce, I want to make sure we touch on that before we wrap up people who have money available to invest, to put away, to grow, where are the opportunities at right now? Where should we be looking? So definitely the stock market. The market has come down, okay? It doesn't mean that it won't go down again. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, this is a great buying opportunity. It could be. The market can continue to go up, but it can also go down a little bit more from here, okay? No one knows, right? But it still is an opportunity for the long run. Not really to get rich overnight because we don't know. It's too volatile at this moment, right? But I do believe that there's opportunity in the market. Um, the other thing that I believe that there's going to be opportunity in is real estate. Mm. I don't think that the time is ripe right now, but I do think real estate may be coming down, especially if we go into a recession, then yeah, there's going to be people that need to sell their house because they can't afford it anymore. There's going to be people that can't pay for it, you know, so, or want to move out of 
certain states, you know, depending on if you're in a high state, uh, high tax state, there's a lot of people moving out of those states. So there's going to be more opportunity. I think those are the two places that I see opportunity. Joyce, I have so much more I want to ask you, but in the interest of time, I'll just ask one more question. Having helped so many people with their money over the years, <clears throat> and I'm holding, so one of the intentions I hold for this series is that the person who needs to see and hear this interview right now is watching and listening, whether they're watching the video or they're listening to some sort of podcast form. What is the one thing that you haven't shared with them yet? What is the one thing, or maybe it's your one wish that for them about what they can do with their money once they head off? Because I want people to have something actionable, right? I think the worst thing they can do is just walk away from this and do nothing and say, wow, that was, there were some really interesting points there. Some that really made sense. If you could give them one action to take regarding their money right now, what would that be? Okay, I'm gonna give you one action, but I also wanna give you one mindset tip. Okay. Um, one action will be know your numbers. Like know how much debt you have at what percent. Know how much you have in savings and in what type of vehicles. Know what income it is that you have. If you're a small business owner, then make sure that you know what your, um, your tax bracket is so that you'll know how much to automatically save in a savings account for taxes so that at the end of the year, you're not thinking, oh my God, where am I going to get money for these taxes? So just know your numbers. That is extremely important for you. Um, if you don't, then you're not going to have confidence and you're really not going to be able to plan. Hmm. So that's my logical tip, my logical wish for people. Um, the mindset piece is to understand that money is not where the value is. You know, we tend to think money is where the value is. We chase money. That's mm. not where the value is. The value is in us. You know, we trade our valuable time. You know, you and I are only here for a certain amount of time. You don't know if I'm here only for one more year or for 40. So I have a certain amount of time in my time bank and I trade that for money. If I work for a corporation, I give them eight hours of my day and they give me a certain amount for that, right? They're buying my time. So if I look at that relationship, who's truly worthy here? Who's, who's truly the valuable piece? It's me because you're buying my time. And so if we begin to look at money in that way, then we can begin to understand that if we're the valuable piece, then money needs us, not we need money. That's a big mindset shift. That was awesome. Everyone, you are going to want to rewatch this a few times and take copious amounts of notes. And if you take anything away from it, gosh, that last little bit around there about money and what's really, truly valuable coming from the money lady. If you, <laughs> if you really, really embrace that notion and just download it into your DNA, my gosh, what a profound shift it would be. I think this is a wonderful opportunity right now, having this time of disruption pause to really step back and look at some of your behaviors. You know, if you're in a place of massive uncertainty right now, especially around financing, keep in mind that 2008 was only 12 years ago. And if we keep in trends, that means in 10 more years or so, we're gonna be in another time of financial discomfort. So consider that right now. What behaviors can you adjust? What, what adjustments can you make? Delaying that comfort, you know, still having some fun, but knowing, what was it you said, Joyce? You said you-, you, you Plan first, spend second. Plan, plan first, spend second. Yes, plan first, spend second. And plan not just short-term, but long-term too, because you can set yourself up powerly, as powerfully. As Joyce said too, there's opportunities out there right now. Even if you only have a few dollars, and this isn't in any way an endorsement to get in the stock market, but it is to say that there are major, major companies that are literally on sale right now for 20, 30, 40% off than they were back in February. Your money could go a long way in some of those companies. Again, talk to somebody who's an expert on that. Get the guidance, get the advice. Don't just go in there guns a blazing. Yeah. Lucky could not. It's kind of like playing slot machines in Vegas. Yeah. 
and I love Joyce talked about the mindset too, about really looking at how is, what are your behaviors around that? And that comes with somebody who's worked with hundreds of people around money and understanding that there's a difference between thinking growth versus thinking fear with money. And <clears throat> this is a wonderful time that if you're really taking pause and you're observing yourself, observing what and who truly matters most to you, you can start to see how your money can become a vehicle to do and support those things in the future. And you might just find that the things that you have been spending money on may not be what and who matters most to you. And in fact, your money right now may be inhibiting you from doing more of and spending more time of what and who matters most for you. So consider that, you know, going through and one of the gifts I think that comes from this time is it gives us the gift of all looking at and pausing and seeing and asking that question, how can we make our money grow? You know, how can we get make our money grow to support us in doing the things and spending the time with who and what matters most to us? Joyce, this was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. your wisdom, your gift, and your, your knowledge with us. We, we deeply appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Absolutely. We'll see you next time on A Handful of Hope, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>